Good morning, everyone. I'm Carolyn Kaysen, University of Texas at Arlington. Um, our first speaker is Harold G. Craighead, Cornell University. He is going to talk about nanofluidics and the nanobiointerface invention, the invisible hero. So we start hunting. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm honored and humbled to be in such an august uh, group. Uh, and you're right about the lights. I'm blinded, so I can't see any of you. Uh, so I, I'll try to keep on time, so let me just get going. Um, so it's hard to get your life's work in 15 minutes. As we, we, so I'll just put my entire life in perspective in one slide. Uh, <laughs> This, this is me at the beginning. I was in my basement with uh, Heath kits, Gilbert science sets, microscopes, SDS models, rockets, taught myself to solder, made uh, uh, vacuum tube circuits. So that's, uh, I made all this stuff empirically, and so I had to get a degree in physics so I could then put the mathematical rigor to understand what I had been doing. So I got a uh, PhD at Cornell on the upper left, and then I, after I got the degree, I decided I'd like to do that for a living, and I went to Bell Labs. And uh, you know, I could go on for the entire day talking about Bell Labs, and I'll say a little bit, but I just noticed that several of my contemporaries and other alumni from Bell Labs are strongly represented in this group. So there's something about that that was a very fertile environment. Uh, but after the breakup, which I went through in 1984, I then went back to the same institution from which I got my degree. And that uh, image on the lower right is pointing to a building that has on the, on the roof a, the letter mu, which was at the, originally the submicron facility and then the uh, National Nanofabrication Facility. So I was there, and I, I'm still at Cornell, and so what I can reveal in this group is basically I'm that same kid uh, building things, but now my microscopes and science sets are much more expensive and sophisticated but I don't think my mind has changed greatly other than I have more understanding of the breadth and possibilities that uh, one can do with the same set of innate skills. So that's who I, that's, that's who I am up to today, so I could quit. But uh, let me go back to my first sort of experience with uh, invention and the patent system and the academic environment. And I just wanted to say that I'm really happy to be here because I think this is a critical time uh, when people of your stature can really can have an impact on how the academic enterprise contributes to important issues. And so I, to the extent I can, I'd like to help foster that. But my personal, uh, my first academic inventing experience was with my PhD thesis, which, uh, you know, to be very brief, was to look at the optical properties of very small metal particles embedded in a dielectric matrix. And because of the electromagnetic resonance that is established with that, one has the ability to change with the material and the size and the organization, the basic optical properties of these materials, which as part of my thesis, I made the materials, invest, you know, did the materials analysis, uh, the optical measurements. And um, what was a little different there in red is there was actually an application for this. I was in physics and it was clear that applications were way on the list, built on the bottom of the list of importance. The importance was, was new science. But uh, the application was, in particular, for efficiently trapping uh, solar radiation. Because of the optical properties, it was possible to design something that would be nearly a perfect absorber of the solar spectrum, that is, black across the visible to near infrared, but at the same time, a perfect, almost perfect mirror in the farther infrared, which is the black body emission range of the thermal uh, radiation. So you can make something which was basically a, a thin film which would, had the greenhouse effect. It would catch all the energy and then retain that for then conversion to useful uh, 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 energy sources. So that was, uh, you know, I could explain that and I thought it was kind of interesting and I could design the materials to do that. And as a graduate student, uh, you know, somebody from a company, and just for your historical history buffs, back in 1970s was the oil embargo. And there was, a, you know, the lines at, uh, at uh, gas stations and there was a furious interest in, in alternative energies and solar energy at that time. And as you know, there's a completely inverse relationship between uh, the price of oil and the interest in alternative energy. So this was at one of these peaks where there was tremendous interest, and we could actually you know, use our physical understanding to address some small component of a possibility. And so as a graduate student, somebody from a company 
who actually wanted to make these films for put, uh, sputtering on tubes that would efficiently catch uh, uh, sunlight and make steam. I was talking to them. And then for some reason I thought, mm, should we patent this? And that was like a new concept. I don't know where I figured out that patents were possible. That wasn't something that was taught to me. I somehow figured out that maybe we should think about that. So I looked in the paper directory we had at the university and found somebody who was the patent attorney. And I contacted him and I said, should we patent this? And he came and talked to me, which was very nice, and basically said, we only patent things if somebody already wants to license it and they'll pay for the license fees up front. And I said, okay. And then I went on and talked to these people because they were getting it for free. I couldn't figure out why they were gonna pay for it. But um, it turns out that on the history, I looked, before I came here, I sort of looked back at how many patents I had. And the first one that's on the books at Cornell is disclosure number 360. Uh, so I infer, if they're, if they're adding them up, in, that the first 120, uh, 112 years of Cornell, there were 360 uh, patents uh, disclosed. I'm just guessing that from the number. Uh, on, a, on a side note, if I had done this today, this would be uh, plasmonic nanoparticle metal materials, which are getting now uh, renewed interest for exactly these same applications. Uh, but from there to Bell Labs, which I could go on indefinitely because I think this is really a role model for what uh, the support and effectiveness of innovation could be. And I was uh, looking for appropriate quotes, and as a byproduct of looking at this New York Times article, I came up with this image, which has nothing to do with any reality I saw at Bell Labs. Uh, the people I knew there would never line up in such an organized fashion. <laughs> so I was so stricken by this, I had to, I had to bring it forward. The only thing I could relate to is every time I encountered a photographer that came to the labs, they would say, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Craighead, do you have a white lab coat you could put on? <laughs> because there was this great stereotype that the, uh, the, the rest of the world didn't know what scientists were. They expected you to wear a white lab coat. So the only thing I can get from this is that in 1966, the issue was the same. And if you look at the gentleman in the left, can you see the rectangular creases on the, on the garment? <laughs> I'm fairly certain that that was never worn before that, uh, before that picture. So, you know, to some extent, this is uh, trying to tell the rest of the world, yes, we're scientists, and look at the power we have by lining up in this way. But I think that's, you know, sort of a graphic representation of what was really a much more uh, deep, supportive environment, which may have been unique, and that was actually the topic of this, uh, this article in the Times, I think in retrospect, saying that this really was a culture that they got everything right. And I think we can look at that because, you know, I think when you were there, you knew what the mission was. The management knew what the mission was. The individual scientists knew what the mission was. It was to innovate. And it, it wasn't distracted by a lot of other things because of the quasi-monopoly of the organization. It didn't have to make a lot of money. So I think there was a feeling that it was an obligation of the institution to innovate and to make that available through the economy, not to make a whole lot of money out of licensing. And I think that's one issue we still uh, wrestle with today, is to balance you know, the general good of society to the individual good of the inventors in the home institution. And that was just not such an issue here. And so somehow I think that's something we have to wrestle with as we move forward. Uh, so it was an extremely fertile environment, and, uh, and several other speakers, including Steve Chu, uh, you know, were a product of this environment. But from there, after 10 years, I went back to the same institution. So I thought it was interesting just to see how things had changed in the intervening 10 years. And you notice that still people like to take pictures of people uh, wearing, you know, white garments that are sort of badges of uh, something. So that hasn't changed. Uh, these are a little bit more sophisticated white garments, in, in this case in clean rooms. Uh, but to come to the technical activities, and so it, it may be hard to remember that, uh, let's see if I can go back, that now there's, there's nano everything, but in 1987 there was one national nanofabrication facility, so there's a little bit ahead of the curve of, of nano being the answer to all problems. And so I, I took over that from Ed Wolf in 1989, and we had the capabilities to make lots of small things. And at that time, most of that was going into the electronics or optoelectronics industry. And so I looked at those as mature areas and thought that there are other areas where that technology can be brought to bear. And so one of those was to take some of the techniques that had been so well honed for the electronics industry and move that into softer materials, whether those are living things or liquids. So again, that's not a revolutionary concept now, 
but when we first started to do that, it was still relatively new. And so particularly in the area of converting the ability to make wires and objects that were very small into carrying fluids, it's sort of, that's sort of the basic component of all chemistry and biology is to be able to do things in fluids. Uh, we came up with a target that people actually cared about to, for both biological, medical, and uh, commercial reasons. And that target was the D it was a DNA molecule, the information that resides in there, which is so critical. And so when we first started doing that, that was also in the mid stages of the uh, Human Genome Project. So at that point, the human genome had not been fully sequenced, and it was still almost a, as lofty a goal as landing on the moon. It was just thought to be so difficult that it was going to take a national effort to do that. And so there's a lot of motivation to work at that. We, we understood part of that and thought that we could contribute some of our technologies to getting at that. And that's a clear target for nanotechnology. If there's any real definition of nanotechnology, the base spacing at 0.3 nanometers is a nanoscale target. And how do you read that base, the information of those bases, the sequence, uh, in an efficient way. And so that was sort of the motivation of a, of a large work that went on in my group and, of course, others, other groups throughout the nation. But we converted, literally converted the technologies that we had in lithography and materials modification to make things that could carry, modify liquids, bring together optics and electronics. And so we did things uh, such as making little uh, wired-like tubes that we could control the conformation, position, orientation of individual molecules, in this case DNA. So we did lots of basic polymer physics studies of DNA and confined objects and learned some interesting, I think, physics that was demonstrated in these new uh, systems. But I think we also lost our fear of, of dealing with single molecules. And so I think that loss of fear allowed us to move forward and think maybe we could do something practical with this set of technologies and skills. And so, to make a long story short, there were here's 20 patents that resulted from research that was basically to isolate, manipulate, confine, identify uh, individual molecules in nanostructures. And the biology part of that, if, uh, my, my opinion is that essentially all functional forms of DNA sequencing, including the original Sanger processes, the active sequencing engine is the, en the polymerase enzyme that comes from the, the real world. That it solved all these problems. Its job is to read, sequence, and make copies. So all, all practical sequencing schemes use these enzymes as the essential part of what happens. None of them, however, really treat them as an individual entity that you can engineer into something. And so that's what we took on. And so the concept actually shown in this cartoon, let me go back. and. Uh, I just as an aside, so that uh, uh, several of my students and I formed a company which was originally nanofluidics, uh, and it eventually moved to California, of course, uh, and then became Pacific Biosciences. And I did learn uh, significantly that uh, venture funders view as one of the risk factor the distance from their office. So the no, quite literally. So uh, you know the amount of money they're willing to put into something is sort of. Uh, inversely related to the distance from their office. So that's a meaningful thing, which I learned. So these slides that say Pacific Biosciences are from the now currently existing company that's carried this, uh, te this technology forward. And they have the money to make these videos. I don't. So, um, so the videos, which seem to have stopped running, but they're so nice. Let's see if it'll run. So the, you see there are four colors there that represent the four bases that are being incorporated. So, the enzyme does all the work. If we could just watch the colors of colored things as they, they entered there, then we'd have the sequence and, and we'd be done. So the idea was simply to read those colors in temporal order, not worry about the fine structure because the enzyme takes care of that. Uh, so the only, only minor difficulty is if you color all the bases different colors and let them float around in solution, uh, then you have this bright glowing white light coming out of your beaker if you try to do uh, Fluorescence. Does that mean I have one minute left? All right, we'll, we'll do it. <laughs> so the solution to that, the simple physics approach, was to defy the fraction limits that are inherent when you use uh, free space optics and to use what I learned at Bell Communications Research, to use physical confinement of the light and the fluid so that the interaction volume is limited not by the wavelength of light but by the physical cross-section of something. So the original concept was to do this with uh, 
in-plane waveguides. That was a little too difficult, so we switched to metallic waveguides, in this case the worst possible waveguide, one that has no propagating modes. And so in this case it became simply something to limit uh, the volume over which uh, optical electrification could take place. And so then the concept was to place in this little optical isolation that enzyme which is doing the work. And now we have in this fully engineered object individual active molecules which are put at literally the nano bio interface that I was going to talk about where the, the one half of the world is fully engineered in optics and electronics, the other half of the world is fully engineered in chemistry and biology, and in between we have the answer. So I will, I'm willing to quit. So here's the real system that uh, the company put together, and it actually has in parallel many, many of these objects reading individual sequencing. And so that is the now a, an available technique. I'll skip all the great things it can do solving all the world's problems <laughs> and go to the end result which is uh, you know not this individual technology but I think uh, you know the ability to support innovation particularly in the academic environment now that the industrial labs have handed that off to a large, large extent is something I think you know I would be willing to help work on and uh, thank you <laughs>